Right, I think we can probably get started with this next panel on rates and recession. And in this one, we will be looking at the potential impact of the revaluation delay and what it means for individual retailers on the ground, um, as well as the impact on high street investment. And of course, as I've mentioned a few times, the, the Chancellor's open statement today had a, a fair few things in it for retailers. I, I just want to give you a, a little summary on that for those who haven't seen it. So the Chancellor's announced a cap on business rate increases for, for uh, next year of 2% and said that reform of the system is on the agenda for 2017 re-evaluation with a discussion paper coming out in spring 2014. There's also further help on rates announced today, including the extension of the small business rate relief, uh, addressing the backlog in appeals, introducing reoccupation rates relief and a two-year discount of up to £1,000 for retailers with properties of less than £50,000 rateable value. So just some of the things there that were in the statement this afternoon. Now, our panel for you is James Lohman, Chief Executive of the Association of Convenience Stores, who's next to me. Next to him is Simon Danchuk, a Labour MP for Rochdale. And next to him, Jerry Schroeder, Head of Rating at Gerald Eve. So we'll kick things off, first of all, with James. OK, thanks very much, Chef. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't write a detailed speech before today because we didn't um, necessarily realise how much is going to be said on rates uh, today. So I'll touch on some of that stuff and our, our response to it. Just so you know who I am, the Association of Convenience Stores uh, it's more as, as it sounds. We represent local shops around the country, including petrol forecourts, so a particular role in this uh, issue around rating. And um, we've got about 33,000 shops in membership. Not all of them are on high streets. I mentioned petrol forecourts there. Many of our stores are in secondary areas, neighbourhoods, estates, villages. It's not just on the traditional high street, but many of them, of course, are in those areas. Um, and, and those retailers have been benefiting recently from... Uh, a move towards local shopping. You know, there, there is a, a consumer trend towards people wanting to shop little and often, and that benefits our sector, um, uh, and particularly you know, ageing population, more people are living alone or in smaller households, all this, all this uh, supports shopping trends in our sector. Um, we're not the only ones who've noticed that, of course. People like Tesco, Sainsbury's, Morrison's have realised this and have come full armoured into the convenience store sector. So while the market as a whole is growing, it's becoming more and more competitive and maintaining your place in that market. It's kind of particularly difficult for, for our members. Uh, those members are extremely diverse in their, uh, in, in their profile. Um, I noticed that Open Allows is coming back for a Christmas special this year, I think. Um, Correct. And you may be aware of the Arkwright Act of 1990, which means that any article relating to convenience stores has to be accompanied by a picture of Arkwright. Um, <laughs> and, and, and now it'll be accompanied by a picture of David Jason in the URL. So um, uh, that, that image is actually very much out of date. Um, much higher, but a third of the entrepreneurs who run convenience stores are women. Um, well over half of them are under 50, so it is not that, that same uh, uh, profile that you might uh, get from watching that very good program. Um, so, uh, and we believe that we're very much the, the sort of the everyday entrepreneurs. I think Chuck, your, your colleague Chuck uh, made sort of coined that phrase, and we liked it, so we sort of appropriated it. But um, very, the entrepreneurs who are everyday entrepreneurs in communities up and down the country who are making the investments, which are really small investments in their own right, but added together are the investments which we think can help take Britain uh, on a sustainable path to recovery. Um, and on the high streets issues and around rates, we were on the Future High Streets Forum. In fact, I chair the group uh, that looks at policy issues, issues relating to that. And the overall economic position for our members is uh, uh, rates and recessions. I'll do the recession bit first. Um, our, our members are relatively well insulated from ups and downs in the economy. Uh, we're not, not immune to them, but relatively well insulated. Uh, we're selling everyday essentials, so we're not uh, as, as, as susceptible to changes in the economy as furniture retailers or car retailers or people like that. Generally, the picture of our members is that sales are holding reasonably steadily but margins are coming down uh, as, as the market becomes ever more competitive. And looking at our last quarterly survey, there are increasing signs of optimism and increasing signs of a willingness to invest in their own stores and buying new stores. And it's small steps, but I think there's some evidence there that there's some, that there's some more optimism in the market. So in looking at rates in the uh, awesome statement today, uh, I think more happened than we would have expected and more good stuff than we expected. Um, we very much welcome the 2% the cap. There's been a long debate about annual up rating. Should it be frozen? Should it be capped? Should it be um, RPI, CPI? And this has been a, a long and running debate. That debate hasn't ended with this. We, we support the cap, actually. I think cap is a sustainable and, and, and good policy. But it's interesting to hear about a cap for one year. That's not really a sort of cap. That's, that's a different rate for one year. A cap would be a sustained thing over a period of time. So that's something we want to get clarity on and understand if, if that is the policy. We think a long-term cap is the right, uh, right thing to do. Um, the £1,000 uh, discount for businesses under 50000 rateable value, the discount is it's a great idea. Put it in context, 
a typical one of our members, and averages are very difficult, so I'll sort of paint a sort of typical picture, but it's actually one about the averages, we'll see. But they, they'd have a rateable value of around £25,000. Um, that would mean their rate bill will be around £12,000. And so the, the, had the rates increased at 3.6% gone ahead uh, as planned, that would have been £432 per year for those stores. The 2% cap brings that down to £240 a year. Um, you see, I've got, literally got my envelope at the back of the crowd. There. Um, and then, so in that context, a £1,000 discount is a lot of money. Now, it's a really significant uh, step the government have taken, and you very much welcome it, and it makes retailers much better off than they were um, before. But another very significant thing this is the £50,000 raceable value threshold, because thus far we've been talking about small business rate relief. We're looking at a threshold around £6,000, uh, £6, £18,000. And to credit um, Simon's uh, leader, uh, Ed Miliband, it was he who started talking about £50,000 raceable value as a threshold for a rates freeze uh, in the events of uh, a Labour government after 2015, and that commitment that they, they made was very welcome. And um, you know, while the government have done many things today, it should be noted, I'm not saying some on the panel, but it should be noted that that debate around £50,000 properties has really kicked off in September in Brighton by Ed Miliband. Um, there are other things in the Northern Financial Statements as well. Um, the reoccupation discount, we think, is broadly a positive thing. I think um, we would put that further, but I think it's a, a very positive thing. I've heard people saying that on Twitter, which I mean, my you know, oracle on the world, that people saying that, um, that fear people sort of leap, jumping between properties. I just don't see that. The setup costs in, in stores just wouldn't make that um, possible. So I think that's a really good thing, and uh, anything which can help incentivise getting empty properties into use, I think, is a, is a very positive thing for high streets. Um, the idea of spreading uh, rates payments over 12 months rather than 10, again, is very good in terms of cash flow. I, I, needn't, I needn't spell that out any more than that. You will understand why. Um, there are some, still some things that are outstanding, however, in terms of rates policy, as I'm sort of to touch on. There's a delay in the revaluation, and uh, Jerry has you know, long, well-established views on this. I think um, we, we were always very sceptical about this being the great bonus to business that it was presented as. Um, the reality is, of course, in any zero-sum game, there are winners and losers, and there is limited and some extent contradictory evidence about whether convenience stores will be winners and losers. I hear that four courts have benefited enormously from this. I have to say I doubt that. Um, they, they, they've seen huge increases in, in their rates bills in the past. I'm not sure they would have uh, benefited. They, they're benefiting from the, from the um, delay. Um, but nonetheless, um, it's a disappointment the government haven't gone, haven't gone to look at that. The bigger disappointment for me is that we've heard today about uh, a more a longer term review of uh, rates. Now, I think actually that may be a more technical review around the operation of the system rather than the means of calculation. Um, but what's disappointing is that we'd hoped that the, the, the silver lining of the revaluation delay would have been an opportunity to look in more strategic terms at uh, the way in which, in which rates are calculated. Um, that, if I don't work out, is unlikely to happen. I, I look forward to being surprised, as it was today, um, in 2014 when that review starts. Um, and, and that long-term review, I think, is really important because you've seen some very significant changes in the way the retail market works, um, notably moved towards e-commerce. And I don't, don't think there's any sense, certainly not from me and from our organisation, that there should be some sort of punitive regime against uh, e-commerce. I mean, that would be a, a bad thing for the economy. But we have got to acknowledge the fact that when the rate business rate system came about, it was based on the premise there, the pun, <coughs> the premise that you, um, in order to do business, you need, you need the premises from which you do business. Um, that is no longer well. It's no longer the case. You don't need a consumer-facing premises from which to do business, and I think that needs to be looked at. Um, there's also the broader issue of um, in, in town and out of town, um, and whether that balance between the, rate, the, the burden of the rates um, system is, is appropriate. Um, and there's the issue of more, even more broadly, uh, property taxes versus corporation taxes. And successive governments actually have been nervous about um, reducing the property tax uh, burden and, and, uh, and, and piling more on corporation tax. Because corporation tax is a much more mobile tax, and so they'll find businesses avoiding tax and moving overseas and doing what um, Starbucks, for instance, name names, but you know, you know what I mean. Um, those companies who have been uh, very publicly called out for doing that. Um, so business rates, the attractiveness of business rates for governments is it's very stable and um, difficult to avoid um, tax. So I think that's why uh, there, there is a temptation to move towards that. What I would say, you know, I've heard lots of talk about we need to move to turnover-based taxes, profit-based taxes, um, and, and, and lots of other variations on that. I well, absolutely welcome a review. I think the review is, is long overdue. I think the industry has a role to lead that. But I think we should be careful what we wish for. You know, there are a lot of um, very, very great complexities in calculating uh, business taxes or business property taxes or business taxes based on other than rental value. That, that system still has a lot of merit. Um, and I think it would be worth looking at how we can make it work much better. But 
Um, the final point I want to make is about discretionary rate relief. There are there is significant powers now for councils to uh, invest in discretionary rate relief to support the areas where they trade, or whether, whether those council areas where businesses are trading in those, those high streets. Um, 59 councils in total are using those discretionary rate relief powers, and most of those are not using them for high streets, they're using them for different things. And that is a real missed opportunity. Now, I understand why, because those councils are not looking at this pot of money and thinking, well, how should we spend this? Let's, let's, how, can we, how can we spend some money at the moment? They're all desperately trying to um, make the books balance at the local level. But we do need to look at how the government um, can find a way of supporting councils to use discretionary rate relief more, and we think that is a very important part of the, uh, the solution going forward in terms of rating and indeed in terms of the high street more broadly. So those are my opening comments and looking forward to some questions. And Simon, you're here to, to give us your thoughts on a, on a business rate reform, aren't you? Yes, absolutely. Uh, well, yeah, let me introduce myself then. Simon Dantrick, I'm the Member of Parliament for Rochdale. I was elected in May 2010 uh, general election. A little known fact is that on Saturday, on Small Business Saturday, this Saturday, I opened my own delicatessen in Rochdale Town Centre with my wife, so uh, getting involved thoroughly in retail, so that's something to uh, look forward to. I will have missed the preoccupation relief, unfortunately, <laughs> which I'm very disappointed about. But uh, yeah, no, I've been speaking about business rates for quite some time. I think it's, uh, it's an important issue. Uh, and it comes from my, I don't have a retail background, but it comes from my experiences being an MP in Rochdale and seeing businesses suffer, particularly uh, on the high street and the problems in terms of vacancy rates and things like that. I wrote an article for The Telegraph quite recently, uh, a week or two ago, about business rates and their impact on social mobility in actual fact, because I think, I think they, they are having a devastating impact in terms of uh, encouraging entrepreneurs to come forward. It's not just around business rates themselves, but it's around business taxes and I think that can dampen the enthusiasm for people to start uh, start up in business and it's not unusual for more people to start up in business uh, during or soon after a recession when lots of people uh, are made redundant they often invest uh, in starting up a new business but there's no doubt about it that business rates have uh, put a dampener on that and, and have really uh, discouraged it. Uh, the politics around business rates and why we are where we are at this autumn statement, and that's where I've come from, I, I listened to uh, the Chancellor's statement, and we've got a copy of it here which I'll uh, refer to in a second. But I think, uh, I think he had little choice but to make the announcements that he did. And uh, whilst I was sat there in the chamber, I thought, well, that's quite good. But once you step back from it and look at the detail and you read some of what's in this, then I think it's a bit underwhelming, to be quite honest. I don't think it's as... Uh, it's not quite as pos positive as we would initially have thought, uh, and I'll, I'll say why. But I think you were pushed into it. I think, uh, I, I, not just myself, but a lot of trade organisations have been campaigning heavily around business rates. A lot of his backbenchers have been uh, speaking out more and more. A longer list of uh, Conservative backbenchers have been raising concerns. <coughs> uh, and then, as James pointed out, uh, we have a Labour leader uh, at party conference uh, cheered to the rafters, not for proposing to nationalise the top FTSE 100 companies, uh, but for uh, saying that he'll freeze and cut, cap, uh, cut business rates. I mean, uh, that's going some Labour becoming the friend of small business. And I think there has been a worry within the Conservatives that they're being seen as the friend uh, of big business. Uh, the Liberal Democrats don't have any friends at all, but that's a, 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 a uh, So, politically, we are, I think, uh, the Chancellor was in a place where he had to go in terms of uh, making the proposals. I think they're quite imaginative, and uh, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm fair on this. I'm not being overtly party political about it. I think, uh, I think the, uh, the uh, occupation relief, uh, preoccupation relief is a good thing. I don't know whether it's enough. I think they har the, they'll half your business half rates. Yeah. Well, it seems uh, quite significant in terms of amount. So I do uh, welcome that. Uh, a more limited increase in terms of business rates, uh, just down to two percent. I'm not, you know, it will make a difference, but it's not a it's not a dramatic difference. And what I liked about what uh, Ed Miliband was proposing was that it was skewed towards uh, smaller businesses whereas this 2% cap is uh, applicable to all businesses. So I've no doubt the British Retail Consortium and others uh, will be pleased about that. With regard to the reform, I think it is interesting. From the speech, you would have thought there was going to be an overhaul 
of uh, business rates. But if you read the detail in this, it talks about reform of the administration of business rates, and I suspect that that, uh, that isn't as significant. Uh, and there are certainly uh, Conservative MPs who will continue to push for a radical overhaul, as I will, because I don't think they're fit for purpose. When you're building in this many exceptions into a scheme, uh, whether it's uh, rural rate relief, whether it's you know preoccupation relief or whatever, there's so many variances on it, you have to begin to believe that they aren't, it isn't fit for purpose. And so I think there will still need to be pressure to get there to be a radical overhaul. But I take James's point, you have to be careful what you wish for. And if it's uh, another BRC, I'm not a particular having to go to, but they're doing some work on this at the moment around uh, how it could be changed. Well, if we follow their model, then it will be the top uh, big supermarkets that, uh, that are advantaged by any changes. And I don't think that really helps uh, anybody. So I think uh, we have to welcome some of what's being proposed. Uh, but I don't think it's as quite as exciting as we might have first thought. Yeah, that's my okay. conclusion. Okay, thanks, Simon. And, and Jerry? Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, let me just sort of kick off, if I may, just with a few thoughts and comments, just echoing in some cases, but uh, some new angles maybe on what we've heard today in the autumn statement. Um, and I agree that it went a lot further than we were probably expecting. Um, I think the fact that the, the you know, Chancellor has agreed to cap increases next year at 2%, well, it may not be, sound all that exciting. You know, it's still a significant increase. But actually, this is the first time ever that a, you know, any government has done anything other than link the UBR to the rate of inflation in the, as at the previous September. So it does break with that mould and make the, the tradition. And whilst, yes, for an average business, it's saving them £169 only, that particular aspect, I think it is still relevant uh, in the fact that it has broken that mould. And... and uh, you know, maybe that is all as well for, you know, for the future. Um, on the Small Business Rates Relief Extension, uh, this is the Enhanced Small Business Rates Relief Scheme. First came into force in, uh, on the 1st of October uh, 2010 and has been increased every year subsequently. And he, the Chancellor has yet again increased it for one further year. I mean, you know, really that's, you know, that doesn't really go far enough. I mean, it, it's you know, quite clearly he's just keeping next year's up his sleeve uh, as a sort of a pre-election bribe to say he's going to continue to take another 360,000 businesses out of rating, you know, for one further year. You know, this is, you know, this is no sensible way to operate. One of the government's claims for its postponement of the revaluation was it would allow businesses certainty to plan and invest. Well, why doesn't that apply to SMEs who are, you know, every year they have the sword of Damocles hanging over their head as to whether they're going to have this rates relief scheme continued for a further, further year or not? The £1,000 discount, I mean, that is a bolt from the blue, and that really, you know, can't be argued about that, is extremely uh, helpful. Um, we're at a retail conference, so we could say who cares about the other sectors, but clearly we can hear bleating, um, you know, already coming from, you know, other struggling sectors who similarly might feel, well, hang on a minute, we are suffering, we're being disadvantaged, why shouldn't we benefit from this as well? Why is it only, well, shops, cafes, restaurants and, and, and pubs uh, which will benefit? I think there's also a little bit of devil in the details still to come about this because um, the government's going to bring forward guidance on how it's going to apply this discount. Uh, and that's because I'm not sure they can actually apply this sort of in pure primary legislative terms. I think they will have to uh, bring it about through some form of discretionary rates relief, even though it will be fully funded no doubt, by government. But that will also mean that it will be subject to European state aid limits. Um, and so that could limit the benefits that will be gained by the, I suppose, the, the, lar the larger businesses with significant numbers of small properties. You may find that actually they don't get the relief um, for, uh, for all of their properties. The temporary reoccupation relief scheme, well, that again breaks with the, the government's mantra for the last couple of years at least, who've been saying, government's been saying, well, we've given you local authorities powers under the Localism Act to grant discretionary rates relief and get on with it and do it and use it. But of course they have not been doing so because they have to fund a significant proportion of those costs themselves. And so the government has finally recognised they need to sort of put some funding, some money behind this in order to uh, uh, get the reoccupation of um, empty long-term empty properties going again. It's a pure copy of the Scottish scheme which has been around for a couple of years at least, the Fresh Start scheme as they call it up there. Uh, it's exactly the same. Um, interestingly, though, the Scots have extended, they are planning to extend their scheme from uh, next April uh, to apply to a wider category of property, and also they're extending the relief to 
um, rate or values of £65,000 and below. And of course, the Scottish values are much lower than they are uh, in England, so 50000 is still not all that generous by comparison with the Scott scheme. Brilliant news for businesses, all businesses, about the ability to pay by 12 monthly instalments rather than by 10. That is a historical anachronism, and it's good that that's going. And I echo exactly what's been said about uh, what sounded like a very positive commitment to a review of the business rating system, and it will be nothing of the sort. Um, reading, I think, what we can see in, in one paragraph, I must just read it from the, from the document itself, the one that Simon's got there, I've got one page from it. Uh, the government has heard businesses' concerns about the operation of the business rate system more broadly, its transparency, complexity, and responsiveness to economic circumstances. And this is how they continue. The government will legislate to allow business rates bill to be spread over 12 months rather than 10 months as currently, to help with cash flow and affordability. The government will also discuss with business options for longer term administrative reform of business rates post 2017. I'm really not sure that those two sentences follow the first one um, <laughs> in terms of what businesses are actually looking for. So what are businesses looking for and what are the issues, I think, around the business uh, rating system? And obviously I'm a valuation professional. I'm coming from, to this from, you know, with, um, with that background. Um, uh, you know, a pro property-based tax has a place within the basket of taxes available to, uh, to government. There's no doubt about that. But if you're going to have a property-based tax, surely the first fundamental of it is that it's got to be kept relatively up to date by having sort of, you know, frequent revaluations. Otherwise, it just becomes uh, unfair, out of touch with the reality, and, you know, the taxpayer doesn't feel comfortable with it anymore, uh, and they're going to complain. You know, you just take, you've got to look at the council tax system that we've got, you know, where we've not had a revaluation since it came into force in 1993 based on 1991 values. Wholly discredited. Same was the business rate system, where there was no revaluation between 1973 and 1990. At least at 1990, we came into the... A new system, we had five yearly revaluations, and they have lasted the test of time until the postponement um, of the revaluation from 2015 to 2017, when we all know what a perverse decision that was and how harmful for many businesses uh, up and down the country, in particular, you know, um, high street retail. Revaluations, what's their, their purpose is to maintain fairness between rate payers, so that everybody pays a fair amount based upon a reasonably up-to-date measure of the rental value uh, of their properties. And what happens is that a revaluation is those that can afford to pay more than those that are struggling um, you know, should be paying less. That's the purpose of them. But the, the trouble we now have, of course, is that the, the burden, um, not only is, is, have we not had the revaluation, but the burden on businesses is now too high. The business rate, the total being collected from businesses across the country, I think has become an, an unsustainable burden. And that has simply happened because of the way in which the UBR has been linked to inflation over time and the fact that nobody ever considered the amount that should be raised from business rates, um, you know, what was a fair amount to take from businesses. And when the, the current system came into effect in 1990, came into force in 1990, the UBR was set simply to raise exactly the same amount of revenue from businesses as had been raised the previous year when rates were set locally. So they just added a whole lot together and increased it by um, inflation. Nobody ever undertook an exercise to say, was that a sensible amount? Was that a fair amount to raise from businesses? And even if it was in those days, it no longer is fair because of the changing dynamics, particularly in the retail sector, of course, with, uh, with internet retailing. So you know, the burden is too high and has to be reduced. How do we go about reforming the system and making it fairer? I mean, I'm not sure we need another fresh review. We should just dust off, I think, what Sir Michael Lyons did with his independent review um, in 2007. And he came up with just sort of, you know, three key recommendations as options for future governments. So I don't need to criticise Simon's party for not having implemented them when they were in power because they were clearly stated to be something that a future government should consider. Firstly, he said there should be annual revaluations. Um, you know, he said that that uh, is something which could take place uh, with modern technology uh, and uh, you know, that would be an appropriate way forward. He said the uniform business rate should be fixed. He said there's no reason for it to be sort of linked to inflation. You have annual revaluations and the tax take increases or goes down depending upon what's happened to property values. And he said with great foresight, he said this could benefit businesses substantially in times of downturn. 
you know, so that clearly they should be paying less at a time when their property values uh, are fall falling. And then the last thing he said is that there should be a fundamental and thorough review of all rating reliefs and exemptions within the uh, system. And if, as a result of having done so, you know, one discovered that actually we didn't need all these reliefs and exemptions anymore, then the additional funds that would be raised should be ploughed back into the system through a reduced level of uniform business rate. And one area I will criticise um, the Labour administration from was that when they changed the empty property rates legislation and raised an extra billion pounds or so, that should have been ploughed back through a lower UBR uh, and not just taken into the, um, you know, the central coffers. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Jerry, just picking up on this idea of uh, potentially annual revaluations, isn't there a danger though that the businesses would lose certainty in terms of knowing what they're... There, there is no doubt that, of course, businesses would lose an element of, of, of certainty, and historically I think it's very fair to say that business, whilst they haven't liked the uncertainty brought about because of revaluations, once the revaluation has taken place and then one has a knowledge of what the transitional relief scheme and one can budget for five years with some certainty and predictability, that has been welcomed by business, and an element, element of that would be lost. But if you think about what happens with annual revaluations, the change from one year to the next would be so modest that the shift in liability would be, again, relatively modest and something that businesses would be able to accommodate within their normal business planning. Instead of that happening at revaluations, one would be wobbling along up and down because that's the way that the market works. One doesn't have, from one year to the next, normally huge changes in, in rateable values uh, and, and changes from one sector to another, which would mean that there would be a significant change difficult to accommodate within mm. the system. Uh, you talked about as well the fair amount to take from business. I mean, James, what do you think is the fair amount that we should be taking from business? A number? Yeah, or a um, <laughs> proportion. Well, I think um, it's, pretty, it's really difficult question to answer that. I don't know what the fair amount is. I mean, okay, well, for, look at the microeconomic position of our members. Um, you know, I know what they do when they are faced with increased costs. The main thing they do is they cut back on staff hours because that's the one element of the cost they can control. They can't control the rate, well, they, can, they can do energy, energy efficiency things, but very difficult to control energy costs, very difficult to control business rates costs, other property costs. So they tend to, to focus on, on staffing costs and, and, and try to cut them. So I suppose the right level of business taxation is one that doesn't disincentivize growth. And Simon made a really important point about um, this is an important social thing about people being encouraged to set up businesses, being incentivized to set up businesses. Um, one of the things that we found through our research is that a, a large minority, about well, a third of, of the members of the retailers in our sector, were born outside the UK. And in London, that's well over half. So for people who are you know, new to the country or otherwise just want to invest and be entrepreneurial, our sector, and there are others that are similar, cafes and so on, is, is, a, is, a, is a sort of first port of call to, to make that investment and to invest and, and and try to deliver jobs and, 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 and create wealth. And I think the way you have a taxation system and other regulatory factors that prevent that, that has very, very significant consequences for the economy and society. So I don't know a number, but those are the things which must be met. Jerry. I'm happy to, I'm happy to have a stab at answering that question. I it. mean, the uniform business rate, when it was first established in 1990, was 34.8p. Next year, with the 2% increase, it'll be 48p. For most of the life of the UBR, it's been between 40p and you know, 45p or thereabouts. But broadly speaking, rates payable has been around 40 to 45% of rental value of properties. I think that if you said to businesses that we will fix the UBR at 40% of the rental value and we will have annual revaluations, um, I suspect that you would say to, the businesses would say to you, well, that is you know, an acceptable and a reasonable level to pay as a, through business rates as a contribution to local services. I'm interested to hear comments from others as to whether that, you know, uh, I'm, I'm right in that making, assumption, making that assumption. Uh, but I think that, and, and maybe this is part of what the BRC work with, with Ernst & Young you mm. know, will, will look at, is the sort of what is a sustainable level of the tax. But I think it is a worthy, a worthy a good question. Yeah, in, interesting you mentioned the BRC, both of you, because they, I mean, their statement today is saying that... Uh, I mean, they've put out quite a positive assessment of what was in the awesome statement and they're saying that the, the cap alone will immediately help retailers invest an additional £90 million in the UK economy next year, boosting good retail careers, the economic recovery and helping local communities. I mean, like you say, they sound quite positive about it all. 
Is that because you think it's just all about the big supermarkets and... Yeah, that's right. I mean, the BRC is the spokesperson for the large supermarkets and, and it's, they are doing their job, aren't they? Which is, I suppose, fair enough, but, uh, but, but I don't think it particularly helps smaller shops and that's where my concern is. So what would you want to change? What, if you want to reform business rates, what would you do? Yeah, no, I think listening to Jerry actually around the Lions Review, which I haven't read, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to go away and have a read of it, but I think some of those proposals, I think, really make sense. Uh, one of the other points that, that, that Jerry sort of touched upon is uh, the fact that the government have repatriated business rates back to local authorities. So half, uh, before, local authorities just collected business rates, sent them to central government. Now they are to retain half of the business rates that they uh, collect. And I understand the principle, uh, the government's logic to that, because it's about getting councils, local authorities, to uh, do economic development to, to get them to take responsibility for uh, encouraging uh, encouraging businesses to develop in their area and, and they get some of the spoils of that from business rates. So I think that's a good thing. Uh, but there's a whole issue about uh, we, we pay, I think I'm right in saying, we have the highest property taxes in the developed world. That's what, that's what I read relatively recently. I mean, we can't go on like that. And you speak to retailers, uh, smaller businesses, and they, they just do not know what they're getting for their money. You know, this is a, they're really under the cosh. So someone has to change dramatically. And I think what Jerry's saying about the Lions Review, I think, is worthy of. Uh, we don't. You don't need to reinvent things. If there's proposals out there already, then let's go back to them and have a look at them and see mm -hmm. see how they can be applied. Uh, and the other thing I want to ask before we open this out is James talking about this uh, discretionary rate, rate relief that 59 councils are using. I mean. Why aren't more people using that, and how do we how do we get that to happen? Yeah, I think there's two things that need to happen. One is there needs to be more um, guidance, education, support, encouragement to councils, um, making them aware of the powers they've got, and explaining how they might be able to use it creatively. So, if there's a an area where there are 20 shops, it's in, in need of some uh, some work and some development, but that development can come from those businesses. But to say to them, for example, we'll give you rate relief at 50%, 75%, and 100% over three years. I'm making all this up, these are dummy figures. But to, and, and in return, those businesses will do these things to improve the area. And that, to me, seems absolutely with the grain of government thinking around localism, around different solutions for different areas, rather than it being a sort of, sort of top-down dictated idea. And I think that talking to local authorities about how they can use, and they, they have some powers to do that, Talking about how they can use that and encourage that is really important. But the other thing, of course, is funding that and supporting that. And you know, we've, we've seen today that the government is prepared to invest in um, business rates support. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm, bro I'm broadly supportive of the ways they try to do that. But I think to make that long-term and sustainable um, and to make it more, a more locally driven system, underwriting those sorts of initiatives and that discretionary rate relief, I think would be a really positive step forward. So I think it needs encouragement, support, information, advice, and cash. Jerry? I mean, there are good examples of a small number of local authorities who are, have actually created uh, relief schemes. Um, see the councillor from Croydon here, one very good example of, of Croydon together, working together with landlords as well. So there are some areas where there are no, no rates and no rents paid. Yeah. Um, Bradford had also, has also come up with a, a, a good sort of relief scheme. The, the key issue, I think, is that in both of those schemes are being financially supported elsewhere. I think the mayor is supporting in Croydon and there's a sort of European Regeneration Fund supporting in Bradford um, because the local authorities can't fund this all on their own. Uh, and so therefore it does require uh, support from the centre. Uh, what difference is it making to the area? Uh, I can't answer those questions. I'm right, afraid. We'll come back to that, that probably in the next panel. Yeah. 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 But my, my, question, my, my thought is why don't they give local authorities the power to, they've given them the power which are welcome to reduce business rates in certain sectors, certain areas, geographically or whatever, uh, give them the power to increase business rates in certain areas and certain uh, locations. Uh, so, so, they might, so for example in Rochdale, they might want to, the council might want to reduce business rates on Yorkshire Street, the main shopping street, but increase business rates on some of the out-of-town shopping areas in Rochdale. Why, why not give local authorities some re That would mm. be real localism, wouldn't it, given the powers to increase the business rates as well? Yeah, OK. So does anyone like to ask a question yet, gentlemen, at the front? I think we'll just get a microphone to you.
No pressure. <laughs> Um, I think the thing that really troubles me with, um, with business rates and, and the disappointment around the lack of a decision really to review and, and think about the, the, the bones of the system is how completely schizophrenic it is. Simon referred to it as, as business taxation. Jerry referred to it as a property-based tax. Of course, it is both of those things. The period during which it, the, the, the UBR grew from 34 to 48 or whatever it's been, has been a period during which a tax that many people think of as a local tax that funds local services was not owned by the local authority, it was simply collected and, and dealt with as part of general taxation in the way that the government saw fit and reallocated to fund local government but in completely separate ways. And the repatriation that we've seen that Simon mentioned is a 50% repatriation with all kinds of qualifications to that as well. And I, I find it really hard to see even with the, the lion's suggestions, I think, I think you need to reconnect what this, re-decide re exactly what it is. What, what, what is it? Is it a property tax? Is it a business tax? Is it unfair for, for, for internet-based retailers to be paying on a completely different basis because they don't need the shops? If it's business taxation, then it is unfair. If it's a property tax, it isn't unfair. It's right because mm. they've got a different tax base. So do they need to scrap it and just think of something else that's... Uh fairer across the board. Jerry, do you want to? Well, as I said right at the outset, I think that you know, a property-based tax is, is, should be part of the basket of taxes. Uh, and I think that, yes, those who operate from property, I think, would expect to be able to, to pay property taxes. I think the level is too high. Those who don't operate from property pay other taxes, and business taxes need to be appropriate. But the balance needs to be right, and the, 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 you know, the comparisons that can be made between you know, what we pay by way of a property tax in this country and everywhere else in the world shows that we are out of kilter and the property-based tax is significantly too high. And, and you know, maybe for the reasons that was explained, you know, you know, the government is very keen to keep that balance right uh, because for the international competitors, uh, competitors of maybe corporation debt is more important. But in terms of sort of collectability and predictability, the property-based tax is fantastic because it's so difficult to avoid or evade. Uh, you know, it's got extremely high collection rates, and therefore the government is not keen on, on reducing the level of it. But I think it, is, it becomes anti-competitive. Mm. Yeah, I, I, well, just a quick point. The, I, I completely agree with the speaker. I think we have to make a connection between the tax and what it's delivering to the person paying the tax. I think that's been lost in all of this. A, a broader observation that I think is quite interesting is, uh, you know, I'm new to Parliament. I've only been there just over three years, but I've been surprised how... We've gone from nobody speaking about business rates. Now we're talking about business rates about two years ago in Parliament, uh, and then it's gradually built up. But if and this isn't a party political issue, the leaders, you know, the shadow cabinet, the cabinet, just it, business rates weren't on their radar 12 months ago, 18 months ago. They weren't even talking about them. I would raise it with prominent people in uh, the Labour Party. I'd raise it in the chamber. Uh, but there's been more momentum building up to that, and it just. It's been interesting for me to see how, behind the curve, leaders in political parties can actually be on an issue. Whilst people are out there suffering in business and, you know, jumping up and down about it and everything else, uh, our leaders have really been behind the curve in terms of, uh, until today, where we get any real movement, any real action. It's not, not enough, but even acknowledgement that it's a problem. It's, it's just been fascinating to see how slow government parties what? are to act. Why really. is that? Because there's been a lot of noise around it for quite a while, for as long as I've been doing business journalism, a lot of, yeah. bit when I talk to businesses, that's one of the main things that they complain about. Yeah, I don't know, I think it's how politics evolves and develops, I don't know the answer, that's mm. why I find it fascinating yeah. actually. And I think there must be comparisons with other policies and other issues that don't always come to the fore very quickly, but, uh, but it has been interesting to see. Yeah. It's a shock of seeing the rise in um, uh, high street vacancies as well. Yes. I think as people saw those go up, who mm. was the question why, then Mary Porter has appointed to her review that raises the profile of the issue again. So sure. I think these have all been sort of little bits of immense and have led to, well, not, led to not, not to say the end point, no. but have led to it being much more widely acknowledged in the rest of the world. So. Mm. And coming on to that, it's been interesting recently whenever I've interviewed the supermarkets, how much they're talking more about their convenience stores. Yes. I mean, how much is that a worry for your... Your members. That's a huge issue. I mean, they, they, they bring their buying power, their brand power, their 
customer information on club card or whatever else into the market they are hard to compete with and um, and there is no e easy answer but we've also got lots of members that I know who are trading very successfully alongside those stores and they're doing it by focusing on the things that make them different so that's about the, the two biggest things or three biggest things. range and having a, a differentiated range typically in a um, and a 2,000 square foot supermarket, you have about 2,000 different lines in an independent, the same size, you might have five, 6,000, which is probably too many, incidentally, but nonetheless, offer, offering a broader range of more quirky product, more different, more new product, um, more local product is really important. Secondly, I think, around um, uh, service, and it's not just sort of, sort of stuff that makes us feel nice about we like nice service in stores, but really understanding the customers. And, uh, and, and having that, that personality in the interface. And one thing is that I'm not, I mean, go, and you know, every right to exist as business, but when you go to those supermarket convenience stores, they are not good at service. They are really, you know, they're, they're, they're miles behind on that. So that's an opportunity where we can be better. Which leads on to the third thing, which is about the role in the community. And supermarkets do do work in the community. It's not it's something exclusive to us, but uh, independent retailers can do it much, much better because they are ingrained in the community. They often live there, have kids at the local schools, are involved in local charities and initiatives and, and the, the challenge for our retailers I think is not just um, give money to a charity or sponsor a local football team, great that all that is, but to, to really engage with, you know, getting to know their councillors, the police, other local businesses and be sort of civic leaders rather than just a checkbook. So being more community led than the supermarkets would be able to be with their convenience stores. Yeah. Yeah. Does anybody have another question they'd like to ask? Yes, gentlemen at the front. Just get there. Thank you. Um, a key word that I think has been missed out is the word incentivization. And I think as you look at any sales company, all their sales managers and staff are based on incentives in order to perform. And when I look at independent retailers, and I personally work in, um, in pop-ups effectively, and these are independents who cannot commit to long terms, but are looking to test markets and move on and build and grow up. But their ability to access the high street is hindered by business rates. And I can't remember where I read it, but there seems to be a, an opportunity for younger retailers or maybe struggling retailers whose very rateable value is to a certain point that there would be a relief on the basis of employing a government apprentice. So there's the argument of taking someone off job seekers, for example, or training people up. And I'm just wondering if anybody has a comment on actually the word incentivization and whether you've put forward any campaigns or reforms along that kind. Mm. Simon. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not here to promote the Conservative government by any stretch, but they, but they have introduced some, and I don't know the detail, it's not my area, but they've introduced some incentives around national insurance uh, for small businesses, haven't they? Two, is it £2,000 relief? Yeah, but it's for, under, for, under, for employee under 21s. Yeah, yeah from 2015, that. yeah. yeah. They won't play, the employers won't pay national insurance contributions. That's right. Yeah, so that, that was another thing mentioned in the statement today. But it is interesting, the point about incentives, just, you know, that, that's a more positive way of doing things, isn't it, in terms of, uh, you know. And, and what they have, they've also announced today, have they not, that the small business rate relief can be over more than one premises, uh, which it couldn't have been previously, I think. So if you own two shops, or not, not shops because they don't usually get it, but if you have two premises as a business, then you can spread it over two. So that's sort of an incentive, I suppose. Yeah, well, I, th I think well, yeah, what I think they've, they've said is that at the, at the moment it's a complex scheme, but essentially it's based upon only having one property. Yeah. And therefore, if you were a business expanding into a second property, you would lose that's out on the small business rate relief on the first one. So what they have said is that if you move, if you expand out so that you have a second property, you Still will keep can. the benefits of the small business rate relief for one further year. I think the other point around incentives and is, is if I think what we incentivise our members to make an investment in a high street or whatever, we talked about rates, what's other sort of microeconomic issues. The biggest strategic issue they would face is if I make this investment in this, in this high street, is there going to be a big supermarket open out of town you know, in the next couple of years? Because if that's the case, there's no, there's no point making the investment. And actually our members are thinking that, but also the bigger companies are thinking that as well. So that says to me that one of the big incentives for high streets is the government properly enforcing a town centre first planning policy, which at the moment there's plenty of well, more evidence we're seeing that it's not doing very well. And we're having too many out of town applications granted still, about three quarters of development taking place out of town when we have a town centre first planning policy. That doesn't make sense. And I say it's, it's not, it's, this isn't about 
us as NIMBY saying we don't want supermarkets. To some extent, yeah, of course, that's, I'd like that. But it's, it's much more about where is investment going to be targeted. And unless you have a proper town centre first planning policy, there's a massive disincentive for retailers to set up in high streets of, of all sizes. Would anyone like to ask another question? We've got time for one more, if anyone has one. Yes. Thank you. Uh, Julie Graham from British Bids. Um, it's worth noting, I think, that what we've heard about today is more about the kind of cost space and the challenges of that. But actually, one of the really important things is connecting cost and value together. And business improvement districts, there are 169 of them across the country now and growing rapidly, are actually about many of these locations where businesses feel their business rate is far too high, their occupancy costs are still high, far too high but actually they don't see the value back for that business rate, but are willing to vote in their majorities to pay an extra levy, a mandatory levy for a five-year term for a bid because they will see direct value back. And I think that's one of the challenges that a lot of the issues, the occupancy costs are very high on the high street, disproportionately high, but actually they really don't believe they get anything for that money. It really is just seen as a, a tax that's siphoned off. And the conditions in the high street aren't good enough for them to compete sufficiently. They need to increase footfall, they need to reduce costs overall, and they need to get better buying in a variety of ways. And that's what bids are gradually doing. So we mustn't ignore the fact that actually businesses can potentially pay more if they see direct value, value back. It's seen as a business investment in the location. So it's not it is price sensitive, but it's not quite as price sensitive as it's sounding at the moment. So it's less of a question, more of a comment, if that's all right. Mm, yeah, it's a good point. You know, people will be happy to pay it if they're making mm. lots of money in the area and they're getting the value for the premises, I guess. And, and it's the point about making the connection between the tax and, and what's delivered for it. And, but I think it touches on a broader issue. I agree with what's being said there about local authorities uh, just being better at doing high streets. I think there, you, you were saying that we need to educate local authorities about how to apply. Uh, plus 69 of, of the discretionary rate relief, etc., which I agree with. But some are just not very good at managing high streets, and I think there has to be a, a, you know, an upskilling of officers that deal with this type of issue, because I think they just, in some towns and cities across the uh, country, mm. it's a real issue. Yeah, and, and the high street is, uh, and what we can do to regenerate it, is a topic we're going to be coming on to in the next panel. Um, but I guess, just to close then, I guess your kind of final thoughts on what you think um, each will make the biggest difference in terms of next year for retailers. What do you think is the most important thing for retailers, I guess? You first? Yeah. Um, well, Sorry, looking, looking, looking around, so, okay, I, I, I go slightly beyond rates, and I do think the most important thing for retailers and high streets is around a planning system that really works. And I do think that is, um, that mustn't be forgotten all the discussion around rates. It's not something we expect any announcements on today, it's a different area of policy, but. Yeah, we're, we're, we're very concerned that um, as we get as we focus on the microeconomic issues and whether a store is going to save, I don't know what's that, 432 quid or 240 quid a year, which is very, very important, that is actually a very small amount of money compared to the cost to high streets, a lot of businesses on high streets, of having uh, badly planned uh, and, and, un, yeah, and unnecessary and unneeded out-of-town development that will, will wipe out high streets. So, um, yeah, there's that angle as well. Simon, yeah, for me, I think it's about the economy and, and living standards, uh, genuinely. So how much money people have in their pockets ultimately affects uh, what they're going to spend on the high street or on, you know, on, the, on the internet or wherever else. Uh, so that is critically important. And what we've certainly seen over the last two or three years is people's uh, income uh, decreasing. So they've got less in the pocket and as a consequence, they're going to spend less in uh, shops and on retail. And the final thought with you, Jerry. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm no retail specialist, so I don't think I can sort of uh, answer the question your, directly. But yeah, all but I would say is that I think that you know all the positive news that we've heard and come from you know the Chancellor today, so far as retail is concerned, pales into insignificance compared with the benefits that the retail would have received from a revaluation proceeding in 2015. Mm. Uh, and so this is you know this is a very modest step in the right direction, it is nowhere near as good as we would have had uh, had we had a 2015 revaluation, and it falls a long way short of the fundamental reform and review of business rating system that is being called for from business and trade and industry organisations across the spectrum. Okay, I think that's a good point to end on there. Thank you very much. So please thank our panellists, James Norman, Simon Dantrick and Jerry Sterling.